welcome everybody. I'm Richard Preval. We're back after a, a bit of a break that we had in um, uh, last month. So we're back uh, since uh, July. And um, this is a kind of first for First Fridays, which uh, are often um, not particularly curated. They tend to be fairly free forming, um, free flowing. Um, but we have started to uh, invite guest, essentially guest curators to come in either with uh, a group of artists or with an idea that they want to pursue or talk about. Uh, and uh, I'm really delighted to uh, uh, welcome Walter Lewis, who is one of our board members here at Art.Earth, who has put together a really interesting group of artists who are going to talk about. Over to you, Walter. Okay, thanks, Richard. I should point out that, 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 that I'm on, on the board of Art Dot Earth and a trustee for what it's three months or four months now. So it, it's a, an enormous learning process, as well as well as this idea of, of curating a first Friday. When when I first volunteered, I, I'd got this idea of perhaps trying to find a, a loose theme through which we could nest some <laughs> presentations from some interesting practices in the eco art field. In so doing, learn about them and appreciate them, but at the same time, create a platform for which we could open up discussion towards the end on issues that perhaps don't have clear cut answers, but which are, you know, on, under underpinning or even undermining many of our practices. Um, and I was starting to think like that when I came across the, 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 the book Eco Art in Action which was published in February uh, for very yeah, respected uh, uh, editors to a collection of essays. I love the title, excited by the title. Uh, the, the, the blurb said it was case studies and provocations for successful eco art, and so I bought it. I was then totally bemused by the fact that eco art was defined as that Thing which is in the space between art, science, and community. And it was a pretty restrictive uh, definition in that that's what you needed to fit in order to get into the book. Um, and it just struck me that in insisting on active engagement, not just, say, with, with science, but particularly active engagement of com with communities, so, so much was being excluded. And whilst there are certainly a number of interesting articles in, in the book and certainly a number of articles from Art.Earth members, overall, to me, I can't help but feel, re, try to read it through, that it is a little bit more like a, a guidebook on help to, uh, how to help little Maisie make mud pies than it was an inspirational guide to compete with uh, Oliver Eliasson. So... The idea fell out uh, that, well, why not have eco art in action as the theme that could underpin this? And particularly since, you know, I, I'd be the first to admit that that we, by engaging with community, we do actually make a start in probably the great issue in terms of a, an activist motivated type art in that we're engaging with 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 a with a with an audience unless we engage with audiences then the our work is 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 not going to have any impact and community certainly has a start i would equally argue that um by defining as 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 they did they're actually avoiding facing up to this key question of how do we widen the audience and deepen the engagement with ecological art. So, yeah, back to First Friday and today. Hopefully that has produced a little bit of controversy, but not too much, so there's a little bit of fervour about it. The plan is to look at three distinct art, eco-art practices, all born out of engagement with the world around in the sharing of that engagement and then open up the discussion of some of the issues I've raised so that hopefully we can get some insights into how we can inclusively work towards changing the world. To the astute, you'll notice I said three practices while the promotional blurb said four. 
cock up on my part in that I thought we were operating on an hour and a half. But I'm, I'm very happy with Richard's hour. And so the good news is I've dropped myself from the speakers. So that, that makes life a lot easier. So we'll hear from each speaker in turn, take questions and comments from each, and I say, then open it up. And no strict sort of format or whatever, let's take it as it goes to keep the discussion lively and informative and insightful. All, all four of us, or should I say all three speakers are not known to each other and not known to me. So I think in terms of good old networking, this is really using art the earth to, 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 to some purpose. So the first speaker we've got is Victoria Burton Davy. When I was looking through the art.earth members uh, directory, I, I couldn't help, given what I've just said, being noticed by words like land totem signals, land rooms, my daily engagement with the landscape. Victoria's name was, was penciled in as one of the first names. So uh, without more ado, over to you, Victoria, uh, from the, the, the wilds of Cornwall. Uh, You'd like to share your screen and, and go away. Thanks, Walter. So... Okay. So I'd just like to well, say hi to everybody um, and to kick off with this quote from Jay Griffiths, who's an author and um, activist and voice for the wilderness. Artists who remember their wildness better than most are animal artists, lifting their heads to sniff a quick wild scent in the air. That really sort of sums up the way I feel about my practice um, and that sort of um, need and sort of spirit and want to communicate what I'm engaging with every day when I'm walking and um, living in a rural and um, natural environment. So I'm just going to just go through um, a few images um, of my work as a sculptor um, and um, sort of have a look at the starting points and where I am now and then hopefully take some questions after that. So I've had a few themes running through my practice um, for the last 20 odd years. Um, one of them are these sort of bound um, bundles, um, some of them quite substantial like this one, the broken, um, which these are elements for this are about seven or eight foot. Um, and then other forms that some more spherical and rounded forms um, ha have also been a sort of theme for my practice. And I've always sort of been using found materials, recycled materials and quite low materials in my practice. And that, that, that's, all, that's been almost entirely the case throughout my practice. Um, this is another three sort of um, um, elements that were old organ pipes. This is an installation at Norwich Cathedral called Wounds of Love. And we're starting to see this sort of monoliths um, keep coming into my practice as well. Um, I had a two year residency at the Imperial War Museum um, and uh, I started really delving into um, structures um, and um, the way things were put together not just the aircraft, but when I was, you know, still living in a rural environment and, and going into um, Duxford every day. Um, but looking at structures and about lines, about lines of connection and also lines of navigation, um, so, um, aircraft maps, um, sort of marine navigation, um, and also, you know, walking lines, paths, roads, etc., in the landscape. Um, another theme that's been sort of constant throughout my work has been um, sort of memory or mapping of um, what's gone before. Um, and this is a rubbing of uh, a whole tiger moth um, at Duxford. And what was revealed through this was the sort of history, because they've got these like really clean paint jobs um, that this, this one had a military paint job. It's from the war. Um, but when you start rubbing, you get the sorts of um, wounds and bullet holes and patched areas that are revealed through that process. Um, and I wanted to sort of 
explore that as in, in a sort of animalistic way and I've got the, I've got the sections stretched out like animal skins drying in the sun on these sort of natural frames um, and also interested in the sort of skeletal um, aspect I've used quite a lot of bones I find quite a lot of bones when I'm walking um, and I use quite a lot of those in my work and this is reflecting on not just that but um, on the sort of structure of boats um, and this is this piece is called River Memory and it's it's basically using old steel pulled out of the river and um, part of a, um, a boat like um, which has still got the river mud on it. So coming back to nature and to the natural environment and the rural environment um, I, I I'm seeing things every day when I'm walking and, and sort of noticing these lines, these patterns, these structures again and again um, in my, it, it, you know, it, it's feeding into my practice sort of bundles that are created just naturally in the environment um, and, and this sort of network of patterns and cat's cradles. This was a, um, a residency called Rural Idyll in Suffolk and I'm sort of trying to sort of have a dialogue here or, or, or sort of question the way rural landscape and sort of quite um, um, intense farming practices distort our view of nature. And this is, this is you know, very specifically about distorting the view and breaking up the, um, the view of the landscape through which we're, we're seeing nature. This is actually at the farm at Dodnash. This is another of those sort of bundles. Um, this is about one and a half meters cubed. It's uh, an, a, an inverted tree root section that um, it's been cut, cauterized, um, and cauterized with copper. Uh, and I, I was really sort of feeling that, you know, trying to sort of have, you know, show some sort of artistic connection, artistic discussion, sort of open up some dialogue about what we're doing to the natural environment, you know, pulling trees up all the time, n not necessarily for good reasons, um, so, you know, quite often for really rubbish reasons, um, and just like dis the destruction and, and lack of care really within, that we've got with nature. So this navigation through the landscape is, is actually really important part of my practice, the, the, the noticing and, and um, the pulling of lines. And you can see here that the, there's this um, big dead tree and, and then I've got these navigation lines coming out from it and they're leading down to sort of port and starboard marks within the um, installation environment there for people to follow those lines of navigation and, and, and discover things at the end points. Um, and this sort of idea of port and starboard navigation leading us home, it's again, I'm, I'm exploring that actually within, within my um, environment now and starting to make interventions and um, so that people coming after me um, may or may not notice those things and may or may not have a connection or... Um, start to question why are they there or what's gone on here or who's putting that there. Um, so as Walter mentioned, I've been exploring these sort of land signals and totems and runes and so on. And this is sort of, a, it's about what I'm finding on my walks, what I'm noticing. I'm really interested in the actual noticing, um, especially in this day of like walking around with your headphones in and your phone on and looking at screens and not actually, you know, looking where you're going sort of thing. That's probably less evident in the natural environment because, um, you know, the surfaces that you're walking over aren't smooth, etc. But I, I, I wanted to start noticing this and then leaving little signs and signals for other people to find. Um, I've been recording those and, and, and this is about maybe opening for dialogue about noticing a bit more um, when we're walking around and picking things up. Um, seeing things. Um, these sort of land runes are sometimes they're deliberate marks um, in the in the environment and sometimes they're um, really incidental. So some somebody might have dropped something um, like this sort of coil of cord 
or it might be a completely natural mark in the environment, um, like the mark in this um, rock face here, um, which is just on beach in Cornwall. Um, and with those, with the with those sort of found objects and found materials and signals from animals that have gone before, um, the landscape changing, the signals from the landscape in how it's changing through the seasons. I started to collect those together and make these um, memory bundles and totems of the walk or of the landscape that I've been moving through. Um, and also I've been um, trying to sort of open up a dialogue or a visual dialogue um, about biodiversity loss. So if I notice, um, you know, something that's died, you know, on my walks. I walk every day, so I often come across animals that have died or insects or so on. I'm starting to sort of create these shrines and then record those and leave them again for people to find and perhaps question what sort of nutter has walked before them. So that's me, um, drawing on nature. Um, yeah, so I'd be, I'd be, in, that's, that's a sort of arc of my practice, if you like. Um, and uh, now I'm, hang on, let me just stop showing this. So now I'm, I'm starting to look at using some much larger elements, like, um, but sort of fallen tree, tree limbs and so on, and start bind, binding those together and, and other objects um, to, to make some more substantial pieces probably more um, redolent of my, my earlier, you know, more substantial work there. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my practice at, at the current pl place, if you like, yeah. <laughs> Lovely, thank you ever so much. Richard, have we got time for a couple of quest quick questions? We do, we have five whole minutes actually. Okay, right. So yeah, Victoria, she gets the prize already. Sorry, can you say that again? I just say you've got the prize already for giving us five minutes for questions. Right. So, have, have, have we got any? Uh, um, is that uh, is that is it R Richard? Who's Martin? Really? Was that you putting your hand up? No, uh, just me getting the screen back with everybody's face oh, on. Right. Okay. We can watch somebody else ask a question. I think Will, you had your hand up. Can I ask a question? Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was just wondering, you know, with all to talking about community, do you get any feedback from the pieces that you're leaving in the landscape? Is there any sort of two-way connections? Um, yeah, I, for, in some, for some of them I do. I, I mean, I, I post on Instagram really regularly and I get feedback through that, but that's like less local, if you like. Um, but I, there are a couple of Facebook groups, like walk, local walking groups and so on, and I post them on there as well, and I do get um, some sort of dialogue then um, with them. Um, but I, I haven't taken this forward yet. It, it, this sort of really starting to, well, I, I guess it's, it's, there's been two or three years of doing that, but I, I've been based in Cornwall for the last two and a half years, and a fair chunk of that was lockdown. So, um, there was the, it was quite difficult to sort of like build any community engagement at that time, um, but um, I'm hoping to sort of uh, get some get some more maybe community interaction engagement through the biodiversity loss thing particularly. I'm really wanting to have open up some dialogues about that. Um, I'm all, I'm I'm a local councillor as well, and um, it's. It would be it, it would be really good to get some action, you know, some actual physical action from the local council about starting to to move on that. And and I think, well, I'm hoping that you know my arts practice will help visualise and open up a dialogue around that locally. Well, did 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 you did you got a question? Uh, just very briefly, thanks, Victoria. It was really lovely to see. Um in a way it felt like a progression as well like a, 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 a maybe where you've come from and where you are now and I, I wondered um if you feel like you've shifted away from the gallery 
format um because what i was seeing was was much more kind of situated works in the landscape and really kind of opening up a conversation outside of the kind of formal art space um i mean i recognize that because that's kind of where i where i'm coming from but i wondered is that something that you're kind of recognizing yourself or is it just do you feel like it's just process at the moment and that you'll you'll go back to more formal presentation space um i do recognize that that has happened for sure um but i also recognize that quite often to get the um pr basically you you, you might need a balance or one might need a balance between mm. gallery space and um you know these sort of interventions that are just out there that someone may or may not notice and that although you know i'm recording those as an artist mm. and a record of them and you know a visual record and um, uh, you know and I, you know sort of exploring thinking about how can i start to collate those maybe in book form or you know however that might happen it's actually really difficult to engage larger groups of a other artists um larger groups of the public without sort of some gallery um space and interaction or support um, and I think that is a real challenge actually you know quite a lot of gallery spaces sculpture it's hard enough to get into a gallery space anyway um, and the pieces that I'm wanting to make are you know I was talking about these like quite big limbs of, of trees and so on bound up and I'm really keen to get like mud and earth and like shove them into and onto these pieces and a lot of gallery spaces, they're just not up for having dirty work in their, in their galleries. <laughs> so it's actually, you know, it, I can see I need that to a degree, you know, to sort of give a megaphone to the voice that I'm trying to develop. Um, but I can also see that it's going to be a hell of a challenge, actually. Exciting challenge, though, as well. I mean, I suppose it's finding finding a space that that you know is willing to take risks yeah you know or or a curator or you know who are just giving you the opportunity to play and explore those materials both inside and out and i i think i think the combination is really exciting potentially yeah I, I agree with you though i think i think it is really hard to find spaces to do that but i think there are other ways too of, of sharing sharing that kind of situated work and um Part of that is about how you capture it and how you, how you represent it, I think, outside of its space. So I think those are really, really interesting questions. And probably, um, uh, Victoria, I'm assuming that some of this changes since you moved to Cornwall. Um, I, I felt, well, I moved over from, I mean, when I say I moved from Essex, it sounds horrendous, but I was on the Essex Suffolk border, so I was really, really rural. Okay. And I moved to the Forest of Dean initially, right. and then that was a sort of um, not not a move of my choice, and and um, and then I had another move that wasn't of my choice down to Cornwall, and it doesn't mean I don't love it down here. I do, but um, I've had quite a lot of upheaval. Whereas I'd been very permanently in my studio and house space for sort of 15, 16 years before that, so I've had, had quite a lot of personal upheaval to go through, and. Um, that's definitely impacted on my practice and my ability to move this this work forward. Yeah. We just got time for one more from Martin. Yeah. Um, yes, I was just thinking as you were talking there about uh, uh, spaces in, in which to put the work, whether you could look at that issue from the same point of view as you look at, uh, you encounter stuff in on your walks in the landscape whether you you know encounter spaces and you encounter buildings and that you might therefore you know which are non-formal gallery spaces but use nevertheless to make these sorts of installations whether it's farm buildings or industrial buildings and so on you know yeah i've i mean, i've been considering that what it, i think it's the contrast in the work so you know, if you if you want to make a work that involves, you know, silage bales or um, 
something like that. If you make it in a farmyard, no one will notice it. If you put it in a gallery space or in built environment, people stop and stare. So it's partly that contrast, um, especially with this sort of really organic material that I've started to use. It's quite difficult to e even photographing um, sort of the signs and signals and things within the environment when I, where I'm walking. It's quite difficult to find spots where they even stand out within that environment. Okay, thanks ever so much. Shall we move on then? Uh, and we'll we'll move to to Will. Um, Will Will, I think he's really pushing the boundaries of networking. In that, I think this is the first time we've talked, spoken, or whatever. I was introduced to Will through a, a Canadian artist I know who's uh, working and living in uh, in Ireland and who I'd met through some critique sessions organised through uh, University of Westminster. And I invited her to come along. She couldn't make it. She's on a residency. She said, but I'm working with this guy called William Bock. Why don't you ask him? So in the spirit of networking and opening things up and not being too sort of introverted. Welcome, William, and uh, tell us all about your practice. Thanks, Walter, and, and great to be here. I'm, I'm an eco-art filler. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm based uh, in West Court currently. I'm, um, I'm, I'm an artist that's, that's really working between the UK and Ireland, but I grew up here in West Cork and have kind of returned back here and I'm making work back um, in in this very, very rural coastal um, context and community. Um, my my practice is interdisciplinary. I, I work with film, sound, uh, photography, um, and I and I going back have come from a theatre uh, design background and making work in public for public space and often very participatory so it's um it's very collaborative my work um and um, involves both artists and non-artists um and has a very uh, strong environmental focus so i wanted just to just for this short period of time just to kind of take you through um a few projects that I'm working on at the moment, very much live and active. Um, and really kind of, I think in the last six years of, of, of situating my work more in a rural setting, um, I, this, this, these sort of themes of identity, landscape, belonging, um, and climate have all kind of uh, coalesced. Um, so the image that you're seeing now is um, of a fuchsia flower, which I'm sure you all know, very familiar. And they they grow, uh, the fuchsia bushes grow all the way around on the road, the verges here in West Cork. Um, it's essentially like the local plant um, and it's become a symbol um of the area it's used by the the tourist board it's it's jewelry is made of it it's it's a it's a very beautiful flower um but it's also very of this landscape um which is uh, interesting to me because the flower is originally from peru and um from chile and is uh, essentially a, a kind of remnant of uh, of colonial uh, movements of plants around the world and and uh, would have been planted here um, in the 19th century in stately gardens um, by people who were, you know, looking for exotic plants to kind of fill their spaces. But it turns out that it grows very well here because where it grows on the mountainsides of Peru, it's moist and cool, um, warm, and uh, and so it thrives here. And really this, um, in, kind of in line with what Victoria's talking about, walking, kind of regular walking practice, um, really in sort of from 2018 to to now really I've been walking much more returning to this landscape and kind of seeing it with fresh eyes and and sort of 
um, thinking about the kind of embedded stories in the land and this sense of of migration as as a kind of a story that is both incredibly relevant and pertinent to the Irish um, Irish culture and immigration that's happened here, but also in terms of the plants. So my work it really does look at the kind of the the intersection or the kind of um, confluence of of the natural world and the, or the 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 plant world and the human world and thinking about migrant plants and migrant humans and and how the story of migration is um and story of belonging uh is intertwined and is present in the landscape so so it's not something like you think of a, a an immigrant or someone coming into ireland or any country um from a different culture and there are all these different ways of of perceiving them of relating to them um so i was interested in the complexities of uh of the stories of migration that are already in the landscape and also of people who are coming in so um over a few years i developed this project called land walks which uh, involved walking with um people both local and new arrivals so asylum seekers and um creating to collaboratively uh, creating these sound walks, which um, were really a, a conversation that was being recorded. It wasn't a formal interview or a, or a, or a podcast in, in, in the kind of way we know it. It was more uh, a record of a time that we spent together walking the land. And in those conversations um, uh, came, I suppose, the, the contrast and the similarities between, for example, these African women, all from different African countries who found themselves uh, in, a, in a kind of, um, I suppose, a ho hostel, really. Uh, it's called direct provision. It's, it's a sort of a space that people who are coming as asylum seekers or migrants into the country have to stay in these spaces. So, um, so really, and, and the, the fuchsia flower and the, all these other plants that grow in the landscape became a kind of starting point to talk about belonging and talk about relationship to, to the land. Um, and in those conversations, uh, I brought in other local people. So I'll just play you very briefly um, one of these walks. We made a website um, that, well, I made a website that, that brings together these walks as individual um, walks that you can walk yourself. So you're sort of walking in our footsteps, but listening to conversations. They're mapped to um, each place that we walked. My name is Maria Maba. I'm from Sierra Leone. My favorite plant is cassava. There is something in my village like that thing. Like this long thing. We plant it and we call it sugboyo. We beat it after cutting it when it dries like this. That means it's okay. When they cut it, they will beat it. They will clean it. It look like rice. And they will cook it. They call it sugboyo. This one. It looks exactly like that. So, sorry, uh, to keep it short, I'm, uh, that's just a little intro, but there is a website that you can go to and, and listen to all of them either at home or you could come to West Cork and listen to them um, while walking those same routes. But this process of, of, of walking together, recording conversations and collaborating became... Um, particularly kind of in light that this project ended in, in lockdown and a time where people were kind of trapped in their locality. Um, I was interested in, I became really interested in this, this word mehel, which in, in, in Irish, it's a, it's a word um, for, I suppose, in, in a rural kind of um, economy or rural context, it's, it's mutual aid, it's, it's sort of shared labor. So it's a, it's a kind of... Um, a shared activity um supporting your neighbors particularly you know going back helping to cut the corn or roof a house or so it was really a, um a collective action but in the land and with the land um and as 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 sort of progression from land walks 
I kind of wanted to, I, I was really drawn to the, the sort of autonomous space that was created. This, this action of sort of walking, talking and recording was um, an active space and, and, a, and a kind of claiming somehow of our place in that, that particular environment. Um, so the work that I'm making now is, is, is kind of going deeper into that and thinking about collective actions um, on the land that, that sort of that create connection both to each other, but also to, um, to the landscape and the environment. So Tarag, uh, Tarag and uh, Green Rope is a, um, is a kind of durational performance installation. It, it, it's, it, by the, it's, it's rope making. Um, it comes from the tradition of making Sugan ropes, which is an Irish, um, word for rope uh, which would have been used to tie down hay bales and would have been made from the material at to hand um, so the 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 premise really was to create a rope that 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 grew throughout the length of the installation through work of many hands and that um so sorry i will just play this as i'm talking um just a couple of minutes, Will. I think. Yeah. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll finish on this. I just uh, I'll talk over this um, this little slideshow. Um, so essentially, using material that is that is local, literally in front of us, is green. It's not been processed. There's no kind of hidden hidden activity prior to the actual um, action. And over a week and a half, we we wove through many different people coming and going. Uh, we wove about 50 meters or 50 meters of rope. It was about 60 people that were involved. Um, started with a group of eight and evolved from there. Um, it it the the rope spanned um, from one lake side of the river bank to another and connected, I suppose, a, a, a wilder part of the, this this town centre. Um, to the more kind of urbanized uh, context. So, again, another kind of sense of connection, but across sort of social, environmental, and spatial. Um, so this is this is just a series of things. So, I suppose that this idea of the metal is really what I'm pushing forward and thinking about art making and kind of going beyond. The, the formal land art, um, kind of big edifice, big kind of uh, phallus in the landscape to thinking more about it as a sort of interactive process that that um, engages audiences that have a relationship already in that place, but maybe not in this way, or maybe would have in the had action to be. Um, so I'll finish there. Lovely. Thank you very much, Will. Um, uh, have we got time for one a question or two, Richard? Uh, we do. We just about probably have to question. Blur. Time for one, just to allow ourselves okay. to time at the end. I I can't see anybody's picture, so I've no idea who's putting their hand up. So, well, uh, uh, yeah, you go, Will. Thanks. Ah, there we are. So, then is anybody? Got questions, thoughts, or well, yeah, uh, Ellie, is it? You, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. Um, uh, great to see that work, um, William Bock. Really love your rope thing. That's amazing. Um, just a sort of question, but um, um, you know, the fact that you have other people interact and working with you when you're having that relationship with nature because I'm out there too but part of my relationship is that it's on, on my own and so I'm feeling my way around things so what you're doing is something quite new that I've never actually really come across in that way that you are actively inviting people making it social and all of you are homing in on interacting feeling and putting things together in the landscape so it was just to make that point really and to see what you you thought about that those differences between a personal relationship and a communal relationship mm. thank you um it's ellie yes, ellie, yes. Thank, thanks ellie uh, yeah no it, it's 
I, I think a little bit, again, kind of going back to what Victoria was talking about, about, you know, stepping outside maybe formal spaces or, or making work in the landscape. Uh, and I feel like that that experience for me has been quite multifaceted. I've worked in very urban settings and then also in now very rural setting. Um, and it, it's my, my challenge has always been like how to find the audience, like how to, how to connect with people and beyond, maybe beyond a kind of formal art audience and, um, you know, in public space and meet people where they are. Um, and I've, I think throughout my practice over the years, I've, I've, we've, I've tried lots of different variations, but I tend to work outside the formal presentation spaces, even if maybe later it comes back in to a gallery or, um, to a presentation space but i think i'm always drawn to this the sense of like you know if i'm meeting people where they where they are so on the street or in a field um you know what are what are the ways that they might be interested in 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 kind of coming to me or um interacting with me and and what is that sharing like what is what's in it for them and what's in it for me because i think that's always the thing when you're working participatory within participatory in a kind of collaborative participatory way you know there's there's it's there's an ethical conundrum there as well like you know how much are they involved in the artwork how you know who's the author so that's what's kind of blurred in this process is is i'm inviting people into a a, a process that is emerging rather than like it, maybe it's a concept that I have, but I'm leaving it open to people's involvement and contribution to kind of finish the work. Yeah, that thank you. That's that's but I think authorship is another interesting facet. Yeah, authorship, so, yeah, for sure. Got a hand up for a question, Richard, or a move yeah. on? Uh, well, it is a move on, but I am going to make a comment because uh, I think what really moves me about. The, you know, the work with the rope will is that I think almost all cultures now, almost all contemporary cultures, wherever they are, have forgotten how to make stuff like that. Because at one time, we all had, to, if we needed a piece of rope, we had to go out and make one. That meant we had to cut the materials and dry them and weave them and do all those things that it takes to just to make a piece of rope or a piece of string. And I think we have, so I think that for me, that you're you're using that to bring people together in a really beautiful way. So I just wanted to say that. But I'm stealing time, so uh, I'm going to shut up. Yeah, well, Thanks, we're, we're, yeah, and um, thank you, Will. So we'll move on to Dimitri. Dimitri, I was delighted when he he he, he responded to to my invitation to join us because it was born out of, or finding it was born out of, if you like looking for the defender of the faith in the sense of somebody who would defend the community. And in, in him, I, I think we find a very complex set of work and understanding, He's both academic and practitioner, but also presenter and, and curator of work through, through climate art. And when I look at it, the work, it's, I'm fascinated because it's far more than mud pies. So away you go, Dimitri. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I, um, uh, and I also want to say uh, thank you to Victoria and Willem. Really, really enjoyed hearing about your work. Um, I'll try to be very, um, well, um, I'll, I'll use my allotted uh, time. Yeah, you've got 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, so um, with, um, with, I suppose, in relationship to art and um, climate or uh, environmental change, um, I, I would talk about uh, the uh, public art commissioning platform I run together with a dear friend, uh, Evgenia, who is unable to join me uh, today uh, because we both have uh, other full-time jobs. Um, she works for the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, and I teach at UCL. Uh, but this uh, practice that we started together about um, a, a few years ago called Climate Art uh, looks specifically at how public art uh, could uh, be a tool of um, connecting with different uh, res resident groups, different communities. And in fact, I'll start sharing the screen. Uh, but I think um, the problem uh, or a challenge for uh, a lot of such uh, works and projects is how we define a community and uh, or a public in case of public art. Um, and um, I think that there's a few challenges that we're sort of grappling with in terms of presenting work to a large un un unidentified 
public is something that's been um, a, a topic for discussion in public art discourse since the 80s, at least. Uh, um, it, it doesn't seem that there's a lot uh, that's really changed. So if you look at a lot of mainstream public art commissions, whether it's in London or elsewhere in Europe, uh, you see a lot of art that's really not particularly imaginative or, uh, you know, uh, stirring a lot of response from anyone uh, who's either living locally or uh, walking past it. So that's really kind of the starting point for uh, for climate art. Um, so what I suppose we tried to do was different commissions. So I'll talk specifically about one residency that we did run last year in 2021. Um, and we're currently working on a new commission for a uh, part of London called Summers Town. If anyone is familiar with London, it's a very central urban area, uh, quite working class and very uh, polluted. So we, we're trying to sort of address um, a few issues that are, are faced by the local residents there uh, by uh, creating a public art commission. Uh, so I, I need to say, uh, unlike uh, William and uh, Victoria, I'm not a, an artist myself, I'm a curator, so I do not produce any art <laughs> at all. Uh, so, whoops, it moved uh, on to the next thing. So, uh, so this is just a sort of brief uh, introduction into what I've already just said, that our mission is to bring to together community groups, artists, and different types of researchers together, because we understand together with Yevgenia that working on um, such a, a, a huge um, you know, subject as environmental change, I think uh, a lot of uh, people should be involved. And I think for us, when we're commissioning a specific artwork, um, it's site responsive. Um, so uh, uh, so the, the question of site uh, remains very important. And it's not for us uh, just a geographical location or an architectural setting. It's more about the complex interactions uh, that happen uh, um, there in a specific site. And obviously, uh, if you talk about site responsive art, you could think about site very differently. It could be a very conceptual understanding, uh, but because we do actually work with real geographical areas, uh, we do uh, consider particular specific sites as in geographical places where we produce and commission public art. Uh, so the residency that we did run in 2021 was called A Vanished Sea Without a Trace, and it looked at, uh, I'll uh, uh, go back to the previous slide, and it looked at, at, at a specific part of the UK, is such and a, uh, and a place called Rye. Um, and one of the inspiration behind the residency was this map I found in a 1953 uh, geographical journal with uh, changing coastlines. You can see just about there's a sort of um, outline of changing co uh, coastlines there. And that a specific Tudor castle that's uh, currently run by uh, jointly by uh, the, um, um, the English Heritage um, uh, Charity and uh, the local ch charity, the Wildlife Trust charity there. Um, so um, when, uh, when it was commissioned by Henry VIII, it was meant to very much defend the land from invasion from France and elsewhere, well, predominantly from France, and it was located right by the sea. And then the sea retracted so much within uh, about 100 years that it rendered the castle quite useless and obsolete. And if you've been in the area, you know that it's uh, quite close to the Dungeness power station, another uh, monumental structure, which also remains uh, quite, um, well, which has been decommissioned at the moment. So uh, it was fascinating for us to look at those two man-made structures that were there and sort of commissioned to last, very much not be transient, but uh, remain there in perpetuity. But, you know, uh, certain uh, things beyond human control um, changed their fate and the fact of the fate, in fact, of the entire community. So that was a, a very broad theme that we asked uh, different um, applicants uh, uh, and we didn't want uh, to limit it to visual artists or architects um, very much the brief stated that any um, any creative practitioner could apply uh, to uh, to stay in Rye for three months and to be able to connect with the local residents in whichever way they uh, they see uh, fit you know it could be either you know, by going on walks or uh, joining some local clubs and groups. Uh, mind you, that was all happening during the final months of lockdown as well. So as we started, it was April 2021, 20, so we're barely allowed to meet out, outdoors. So that was a bit of a challenge. And 
we do work um, as neither Evgenia nor I have specific uh, knowledge in every area. We're not we don't we do not consider ourselves very um, you know sort of um, uh, omnipresent in our knowledge. We do try to um, form uh, a, a sort of um, uh, advisory boards for each project we're working on, and specifically for uh, for this residency, we had um, a few academics, uh, in particular Dr. Helen Birmingham from uh, from uh, a colleague from UCL is a a marine geographer and her help was absolutely crucial to this work. We also had uh, great assistance from people working in architecture um, and uh, structural engineering and local artists as well. So that was um, crucial for us to be able to select three unique um, uh, voices, um, uh, creative voices that would uh, partake uh, in the residency. Quite frankly, that being our first project, we were slightly overwhelmed uh, having such a huge response. Uh, we did receive over 400 applications we didn't um, envisage that at all um, to begin with but it was a wonderfully interesting and humbling experience to to go through them a lot of the ideas were absolutely brilliant so I'll just quickly show you the three uh, resident artists we uh, chose to take part in the residency they were all British artists um, or and based in Britain. And again, that was uh, something uh, we're currently working on a different project, as I said, um, uh, and I'm hoping with this um, new project uh, to attract people from, you know, further afield from Europe, um, maybe not America, uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think it's good to have different voices and, uh, and different perspectives on certain uh, challenging situations. Uh, but because of COVID, we couldn't quite, um, couldn't quite uh, extend the um, invitation to, uh, to further groups. Uh, so th those three artists reinterpreted, uh, or the, those three practitioners reinterpreted the brief quite differently. So the first work of that was probably one of the most noticeable. Uh, I, I mean, it made uh, quite a, um, hopefully not a very phallic, but quite a bit of a mark on the landscape. Um, and uh, it was the structure designed by a locally based artist, uh, um, um, uh, artist jo Joseph Williams, who was born in the area, went to school, had a lot of local knowledge and really helped the, other, the others actually to engage with the local community. Uh, but his reinterpretation of the brief was looking at defense architecture and also looking at the coastline as the site of landing of refugee boats. So he's, um, um, particular, that particular part of his Sussex is where a lot of um, refugees do land in the UK. And um, his um, idea was this metaphorical beacon of hope, as he called it. And I'm gonna stop sharing this screen. I'll quickly try and share another screen with the so you could see how he was constructing this beautiful pavilion um, very quickly. I hope you can all see a uh, YouTube uh, link. Uh, this is a sort of a meditative film just showing uh, the work in situ. It's a nature reserve. So we're very, very privileged to work uh, on this specific site. Also, there's a lot of history. It was the Second World War. There's some artifacts, and also where fishing boats still go out. And Joseph was inspired by this local uh, flower as well, the yellow horn poppy that grows there, and that's inspired the colour of the uh, of the tent of the pavilion. Uh, but bamboo as a material um, is something the artist works with a lot, and um, he we were specifically looking at using European grown bamboo because. As you know, it's um, the, the 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 crop itself could be potentially carbon neutral. Uh, the way it uh, sequesters carbon, but also the way it's grown and replenishes the, the soil. Um, uh, but also he was ex experimenting with those um, ancient techniques. Um, obviously, bamboo has been used in some countries outside of Europe for absolute centuries. Um, so he created this really beautiful, subtle intervention there, which apart from looking quite beautifully and it was used by local residents as a site for yoga practices or informal meetings the Sussex Wildlife Trust charity used it for their education outdoor events um, but it was a very cleverly designed architecture building because it's, uh, as you can see it's location right on the coast it had to be engineered very soundly so we're very grateful for the support from AKT2 a very large engineering firm that were really kind of interested by this idea 
and hopefully they they sort of the collaboration with the artists also informed their thinking about larger scale projects um, as well. So this um, uh, structure of the tent has been brought to London. I'll just skip through the video, show you uh, what it looked like at the end. Um, um, and it was featured in the uh, uh, London Design Week after that. Uh, but um, uh, the idea behind this brief, obviously, was also engaging with local residents and how they experience the landscape. And um, this is obviously the site where a lot of people do walk and practice uh, certain things like yoga, for instance. So that was really a response that the artist uh, sort of, uh, I suppose, captured by his by his creation uh, there. So that's one of the works. And I'll stop here because I think uh, that's probably enough of it. Um, uh, have, a, have another minute if, if, if if you can sensibly yeah. fill it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll just share the presentation one more time. I'll just show you the other two works uh, yeah. very briefly. Uh, so they were quite different in the way they responded. So the second participant was um, Alistair Dabling, who is a multidisciplinary artist, a visual artist, a filmmaker, and he produced this beautiful uh, film, which is uh, actually being featured at the moment uh, in uh, Copenhagen as part of the architecture festival there. So he looked, um, and you can, uh, I can share this slice very, very happily with you. There's a clip of Alistair's work. He interviewed um, a lot of the uh, local residents um, and, and also um, actually refugees who ended up living in this part of uh, the UK and talking to them about this idea of protecting the land and what does it mean to sort of to uh, look at uh, this idea of uh, coastline as a sort of the impenetrable border between the UK and the rest of the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was looking very much at the two structures, uh, the power station and the the castle. So this is just one of the clips, uh, but it's a very beautiful, um, uh, uh, evocative, quite haunting uh, video that he produced there. So that's one. Uh, let me just try to stop share and share the other one. Whereas finally, the third part participant of the residency, uh, Mo uh, Langmuir, who's a London-based uh, practitioner and uh, 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 biologist, uh, she worked very much with the local residents uh, by practicing different types of citizen science. So mapping, she was using this wonderful rat balloon, which reminded me of a 1960s French film uh, about a boy in balloon. And um, she was sort of capturing a lot of the local landscape, uh, sort of, um, this is one of the techniques, as I understand, uh, that is used by uh, citizen scientists in, in mapping. So she was sharing her knowledge with uh, younger uh, residents of Rye uh, and some other resident groups there. And um, her final installation and presentation was this uh, local museum of Rye. So she's asked uh, uh, the residents to bring together, or to, to bring together objects, or to bring an object, to donate an object for a temporary exhibition that would, um, and she, she asked them to categorize that uh, the object they brought, whether uh, as an animal, vegetable, or a mineral. So uh, referencing this very old uh, game, uh, but also looking at our knowledge about nature and this division between nature and culture. It's a very, um, I, I think it was a very subtle and beautiful work. And, and it certainly resonated with the local um, uh, residents, not so much outside Rye, uh, whereas uh, where the beacon, the yellow, uh, bright yellow uh, structure became quite uh, sort of popular outside of it. Uh, but just to sort of conclude maybe my, my thoughts um, on the residency, and thank you so much for, for listening to my, my sort of um, incoherent <laughs> ramblings. Um, the, um, I, I suppose working with, um, working with a community um, uh, proved um, an interesting experience. And obviously I think uh, also further challenged my assumptions as a curator of what, how we define a community and how do we, who do we, whom do we actually um, address when we produce work? Because obviously a lot of people were interested in uh, what we were doing there. Some people, quite frankly, didn't care, and we really didn't want to, uh, obviously, um, uh, sort of force anything onto um, onto anybody. But I, I suppose with works which are presented in a public realm, I think for us the important thing was that. 
there was a, a degree of discussion with the resident groups as to how they see the work there. We weren't uh, necessarily prepared to maybe uh, be dictated uh, as to what uh, art should look like, but you know, it was still very interesting to see what the responses were. And uh, they were largely positive, but it, 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 it's not really the point. I think it would be quite interesting as well to produce a work that is not necessarily uh, as pleasing to the eye, but maybe uh, provoke some important uh, questions about the climate um, uh, collapse we're all experiencing at the moment. So yeah, thank you very much for, for, you, for listening and uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank, thank you, Dimitri. I mean, that certainly introduces, uh, uh, well, you, you say you're not an artist. I, I, I think you're just, just, just a, a different form of artist. I mean, you, that, yeah, I, I get anything but the impression that, that you've sort of set a stage and then just let people do it. You, you were part of that creative process. But perhaps uh, the time is is running short and not not wanting to to sort of keep everybody hanging on. Perhaps if I if I if I try and sum up, but sum up in, in the sense of a question of we got it right, the message that seems to come to me very strongly from today's presentations and discussions is that yes, eco art is very much more than just community. It is it about what. Uh, or, there are all sorts of ways of fostering ecological empathy through a sense of experience. And the problem that we all face and that we need lots more discussion and lots more opening up by the likes of this, if, if that second reaction of, of Dimitri, is, is how to create an audience. Because that, that's where we're all falling down at the minute. I mean, in, unless we get engagement, then the art falls flat. Is that is that a sen a sensible endpoint to to say perhaps you know as we move on we move it on to a, a discussion more specifically around how to create audiences and particularly audiences outside the conventional art space. Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of the work we've seen today, uh, which is really engaging. People in lots of, in very different ways, but nevertheless trying very hard to engage is about making audience too. It's mm -hmm. about the, you know, the, the if if a for example if a community public artwork really works, then it has its audience and the audience engage with it and they they actually love the work then. And clearly, you know, the, the work you showed us, Dimitri. Uh, did people really use the pavilion? Did they? Did they engage with it and use it and play with it and find find their own ways to use it? Yes, absolutely. So um, because the work is um, you know was so inviting, it was just right there. So yeah, as I said, there were some local groups practicing yoga, which was really uh, pleasing, uh, nice to see, and also there were. Uh, school groups uh, uh, and um, uh, the charity Sussex Wildlife Trust who allowed us to construct it there because it's obviously it's a nature reserve used it in their uh, education program so yeah it, it was quite widely used and um, which was quite good to see and I think it was right after lockdown so people cherished this opportunity to, to be somewhere together so I think that was quite a, quite a nice thing to facilitate. Yeah, Victoria ask a question about the selection of the candidates that you had there because they all seemed very young you know, as an older practitioner it's actually quite hard to Yes, I, that's a very good question. And um, also we could go uh, down, yeah, in terms of diversity, it wasn't very diverse at all. In fact, uh, we didn't have any participants of colour either. Um, so that was, again, something we did not, uh, we didn't receive a huge amount of applications from um, um, more established uh, artists for some, for some reason. I think maybe it was to, to do with the fact that it's a brand new uh, so back 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 then in 2020, climate art just started. So I think maybe the we weren't really as uh, well we weren't really known to to um, to people. Although we did advertise our open call on all the regular channels, um, and also so that's something actually we're trying to address with the current commission. We're trying to. Um, you know, to tr trying to attract people from different walks of life as well, and sort of from different communities, from different segments of society, because I think it's really important that not um, uh, one specific demographic is involved in that uh, conversation. Yeah. Remember the opportunities page for art.earth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, the fact that you had, what, 4,000 applications means I think you were probably doing a fairly good job. With your um, yeah, I think uh, we've seen so much amazing work today, and there's so much that could be talked about, and we, you know, each each artist could easily fill the hour. Um, so I really want to uh, say a huge thank you. I should not 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 use up Walter's role in signing off, but I I personally just want to say a huge thank you to the artists who shared their work today. There's some fabulous work, and we will uh, also make sure that word gets out about the recording of today's session, um, because I think there's some amazing work in there, and we'll also make sure that your websites and other information is shared alongside that. Thank you very much for your interest. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And yeah, a personal thank you to uh, all three of the speakers for uh, putting up with uh, me and various diversions and whatever during the, the, the run up. Thank you so much. So, are we are we all done? <laughs> yes, we're all done. So I'll we'll just say uh, you, you're not shutting us off, Richard. I'm, I'm wondering I'm, what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> I'm not shutting off, but I think we will say goodbye and thank you very much, everyone, for for joining us. And we'll see you next month where we have the um, another uh, group who's coming into uh, uh, as as guests, uh, which is sustainable the sustainable dark room. Uh, who are doing, doing some amazing work, uh, mostly in London and Bristol, but uh, also as well. We're working with alternative uh, well, photographic well, techniques. Do you want to shout out, Will? Sorry, yeah, no, I just wanted to um, ask actually, Richard and, and Walter, is there, um, I know there's the website, but do you have um, a listing of all the people who are involved in past and future talks? So is that is that a resource that we can access or? Uh, 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 it's, it's a very good question. We, we there, there is simply a page that lists them all. So uh, you have to kind of work your way through. So the answer is no, and I think we should. So I will. That would be very uh, interesting I, to... I will, yeah, I agree with you. And I will put that on the to-do list because it's quite hard to see just from scrolling through the history to see who, who's actually been involved and who's presented. So mm. I will make a note of that. Yeah. Can I just say, it, I mean, it's, it, it's um, very useful. These talks are just really good for people. Um, they're involved in the same practice. And so having access to recording, because I've missed a couple, um, I think would be really good. Yeah, the recordings are all there. It's just a question of uh, uh, having to wade through and find out which ones you might want to watch. So okay. we'll, make, we'll find another way of categorizing them so that uh, okay. we can kind of search a bit. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm going to call it call a halt, and uh, it's lovely to see you all. And we will we say we but we'll be back first, whatever the first Friday is in October, um, with this sustainable dark Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great holiday, Richard. I will. <laughs> Safe sailing. <laughs> Thank you. Boating. Up the, up the boats where you left it before. Where you... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bye. Bye.